It's Waxing Lyrical, baby. Hello, Waxers, and welcome to Waxing Lyrical with Mains and Dots. I'm mean, your host, Mains, my colleague, trying to work out if he can get the second round pick and lose and gain $16 million. It's Mr. Neil Dutton. How are we, Neil? The season hasn't even started yet. The league year doesn't open, as we record this, for another eight minutes. It's, today has already wrecked my head. This is the this is the strange thing about legal tampering, I guess, slash start of the league year, slash whatever, is that all the deals are done, so we thought we'd start eight minutes early, seven minutes early now. Um, we're going to go through some of the big, I guess, really offensive, quote-unquote, uh, free agency moves, give them a, a fantasy slant. And uh, and also, we've got the brilliant Matt Harmon with us a bit later on. We spoke to him on Tuesday, uh, and we got an interview with him talking about loads of different things, including how to cook Brussels sprouts. But, you know, that's just where we are. I, I, I asked. People gave me the questions they wanted the answers to from Mr Harmon. They did, and, and weirdly enough, they wanted to know about sprouts. So I guess I guess let's just get straight into it because uh, we'll try and run through these as, as quickly as possible. First one, first things first, it happened literally moments ago. Um, Brock Asweiler has been traded to the Browns along with a second round pick, basically, so the Texans can trade for Tony Romo. Is that how you would read it? That's how I read it. Yeah, basically, it's a, a essentially uh, the Cleveland Browns have just. Spent seventy million dollars on Texans are solid. Yeah, if you if you look at it, it's, they've what they've done is they've got I think the two thousand eighteen second round pick from the Texans, and they've taken Brock Osweiler, so that um, that frees up the sixteen million that the Texans would have had to pay Brock Osweiler. Um, to allow them to guess to to see what they can do with Tony Romo for the one game he plays before he falls into a million pieces, like a shattered piece of glass. It's coming. Um, I, guess, I guess if if we focus on that one, don't, what what we should say is that from a fancy point of view, don't don't worry. Brock Osweiler isn't going to play. I don't. No. I don't think there's any reason for him to be to be thought of as playing, and it also probably doesn't mean you should change your draft boards to think that the Browns aren't taking a quarterback at either one or twelve. No, absolutely. It's literally. It's just. It's, a, it's asset acquiral. It's you know. I'm sure he doesn't want to hear the word. It's money ball. It is. It is. Take total. someone's. Yeah. You know, take someone's garbage. See what you can get for it. Get as much as you can. Repeat. Survive in advance. In in, in 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 terms of um, players who, who could be affected by this deal, uh, Kenny Britt uh, is signing, I believe, a forty million dollar four year deal with the with the Browns. Again, it's one of them. I say the numbers. I don't really know why because he'll never get paid that. Mm. Um, Britt did okay at Los Angeles without a quarterback, so I'm not really. So I assume he's going to try and rinse and repeat that without a quarterback in Cleveland. Have you seen the line they've put together though, Cleveland? Yes, they have uh, got Kevin Zeitler, obviously, along with Joe Thomas and a few others. You, um, they will be, it looks like, stout, uh, and hopefully that will allow Hugh Jackson to get them running the ball a bit better. Yeah, bizarrely doing, you know, essentially a good football decision. Build them, make yourself str- strong. And they've got Isaiah Crowell, you know, so they know that they can pound the rock. Duke Johnson should be back fit. It's just the quarterback, you know. It's it ultimately it comes down to that. But I guess if if you've got a good running game and a solid defensive line, you know, the 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 Cowboys proved that if you can give your quarterback a lot of time, you can get a fourth round pick to do a very good job. And I, I assume they'll be looking to do something similar. Exactly. I mean, I hate I hate the idea of the Cowboys being a model franchise, as it were. But they were pop. You know, they everyone thought in that 2014 they'd be historically bad. They got to the playoffs, and you know they've been there. You know, they've been there twice in three seasons now. So yeah, that's what you do. <coughs> then we moved to the the start. Well, I guess the start of legal tampering. One of the first deals was Brandon Marshall to the New York Giants. Done. Um, gets to stay in New York. Gets to carry on doing. I think he does a show on Showtime. Is it? 
um, in the States. Just inside the NFL, yeah. Inside the NFL on Showtime. Um, I assume, based on the fact that Giants went to the playoffs last year, this is this has got to be Brandon's chance to make the playoffs. You'd think so, yeah. I mean, he has said you know, that he wanted to sign for a, a genuine contender. You've gone to the Giants, Brandon. Um, it's an upgrade on Victor Cruz, and basically... Uh, quite frankly, I think it shows what they think of Sterling Shepard. They think he's a slot receiver, he can't do jack anywhere else, and, you know, that's already beginning to look like a bad pick. But, um, you know, when Brandon Marshall comes out and says, no, no, Odell Beckham's the, uh, the one, I'm the two, just remember that he said that when at week 10, Brandon Marshall's got 30 catches. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm, I'm... The steal intrigues me in a multitude of different ways. Um, one, the thought of Brandon Marshall and Odell Beckham being in the same dressing room, on the same side of the ball, both looking for targets, can only fill me with joy. And, you know, as you said, it is an upgrade on Victor Cruz, but I don't know if, you, if anyone noticed, but the reason that the, the Giants were not as good an offence as they should have been last season was the quarterback, and they haven't resolved that. And unless he's oh, going to get magically healthy or magically get his arm back, um, I don't see how this improves the offence. Basically, it's it's like going to a, it's like a man with no knob going to a brothel. I have no real response to that. Um, no. One one person who's staying where he is, uh, disappointingly for uh, Dutton and and John Barnshad, who, who we spoke to before from Bleeding Green Nation. That's Kenny Stills who's staying at the Miami Dolphins. Dutton. Yeah, I mean, ultimately he was you know going to go for ludicrous money, so. I mean, I, I like the idea of you know Kenny Stills at eight million when it sound you know when basically it sounded like it was going to be a reasonable price, but then they start talking twelve million or so. So basically, it shows that you know the the Dolphins are trying to keep things in house. They're trying to have some continuity on their offense, but you know it's he's such a boom or bust. <clears throat> excuse me, touchdown or nothing. You know, can he build on that? Because he's certainly being paid to be more than that. Um, if we move on to my um, team, uh, who are a dumpster fire at the moment, and I'm glad free agency has happened because hopefully it will hide the fact that they are dumpster fire. But what they have done is 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 traded. Well, not sorry, have lost two of their uh, wide receivers uh, already. And um, Pierre Gosson is a uh, following Kyle Shanahan to the Forty Niners. And uh, Deshaun Jackson is going to be um, Jameis Winston's deep threat in Tampa Bay. Which one do you think will, will have the bigger impact on the team, Dutton? Um, well, I think in terms of a talent point of view, I mean, I think it's a good move for both of them. Um, I think Garcon is going uh, to be the guy because the San Francisco 49ers generally have no one else. We've talked ad nauseum about what Kyle Shanahan likes to do with his offense. He likes to have his ex-receiver and basically feed him. Well, Pierre Gosson has been that ex receiver in the past. Um, it was it, with the with Washington, so we know he's going to get fed a lot of targets. Deshaun Jackson is not going to be the guy. He's going to be the complement to Mike Evans. Now, basically, he'll get his you know thousand yards, six touchdowns, something like that. But Mike Evans, this really helps him because he's not going to see you know double double coverage all the time. It's good for Cameron Brace. I'm not getting sucked in, but already the Tampa Bay offense, you know, depending on what they can do at running back, looks like it could be fertile fantasy ground. Um, yeah, don't, don't don't do that. We've been we've been to Bucks Bucks party land before, and and it's got us burnt. Um, if we move on to your team, um, at the moment, I'm desperately trying to spend money. Um, as we speak in a room with at least three other parties trying to trying to get Alson Jeffrey on the on the books. At the moment the only player they've signed is uh, Tory Smith. Um so are we looking for Carson Wentz to get a lot of uh, off- offensive pass interference yards this year? Well if I moves the ball. I mean Tory Smith is better than what they had. I don't think they can deny that. In terms, if he's fully fit, if he's healthy, you know what he does best is run very fast in a straight line, and his catch rate is abysmal. Um, but you know when he does catch the ball, it's usually for about seventeen to twenty yards. He's not a number one. He went and got paid like one in San Francisco. He's made his money. I would be happy with the Tory Smith uh, signing as long as the Eagles sign someone else as well. If it's just Tory Smith, no, then I'll 
uh, what friend John says, the Eagles either need to get Brandon Cooks in or they need to move up in the draft. He is not the answer. He is part of the solution, but he is not the answer. And teams that probably don't need the solution would be move on to the uh, New England Patriots who have traded. Uh, obviously, Bill Poley not in charge of the uh, Colts anymore. Uh, have traded for Dwayne Allen um, and so lost Martellus Bennett. In theory, don't I guess a younger version of Martellus Bennett for the same kind of offense? Yeah, um, the, the big difference is that Martellus Bennett stays on the field uh, generally and isn't injured, which Dwayne Allen does have somewhat of a problem with. Dwayne Allen's a good, you know, he's you know he can serve both masters as it were. He can block, he can catch. Um, there was disappointment last year because people thought, oh, now Kobe Fleen has gone, he can be the guy, and then he lost out to Jack Doyle, who, as we said in the past. Sounds like an, an Irish gangster in Chicago in the 20s. Um, now Doyle is free to be, you know, the guy, unless they decide to do something stupid like sign Alshon Jeffrey or, you know, or take O.J. Howard. Um, but yeah, it's ultimately the question that we have to ask is, you know, is this someone coming in to play the Martellus Bennett role as a compliment to Gronk? Or is this gonna, is someone who's going to have to come in and basically replace Gronk? Yeah, I think that's one of those hidden ones, Dutton, isn't it? You, you just you, you begin to wonder, is this going to be something that um, that is is needed to replace Gronk due to his injuries? But then if you're going to do that, I'm not sure you get to Wayne Allen because he's always injured as well. And it kind of is this strange concept of now you've got two oft injured tight ends and you've just got to hope that they jigsaw well enough that you have at least one of them on the field at, at, at a time. Because if you can get them on the field, I think both of them are guaranteed to, to get you yards and touchdowns. Um, Adam Schefter is tweeting that Jeffrey to the Eagles, by the way. Oh, I don't, well, well let's, let's get to it. This is what you wanted. So um, tell me all about it. Can't argue with the talent. Um, have to argue with the fact that last year he took what must have been the worst performance-enhancing drugs of all time because he was pop, I'll use that again, and got pop for four games. He shown can be productive. He can go up, he can be the jump ball. He's, you know, he, he can go across the middle. He can do the hard work. This is what I was talking about. This is someone along the lines of a number one receiver that basically lets Tory Smith run free. It opens up things for Zach Ertz. If the Eagles can sort out a running game, it helps. The one big person it doesn't help is Jordan Matthews. There's now no chance, I think, of Jordan Matthews getting a new contract, and he'll probably they'll probably be looking to ship him along. Is is this is this going to be one of these? We've got Alshon Jeffrey. He's our number one receiver. We're going to throw it at him 120 times this year. Is it is it kind of? If you're going to have anyone on the Eagles' offense, this is who you have. Well, I don't know. Um, the Eagles, as I say, the, the Doug Peterson, Andy Reid offense is quite multifaceted. Remember that there's only been, I think, last time I checked, under Andy Reid, there's only been five wide receivers who've gone over a thousand yards, and Deshaun Jackson and Jeremy Macklin have done it twice. Uh, sorry, yeah, Jeremy Macklin's done it once in Kansas City, and Deshaun Jackson's done it twice. It's not an offense that you know. It's not feed your ex. It's not give this man all the targets. It's always been something of an equal opportunities. But you'd have to imagine, given the red zone presence, and given basically this is why they're going to bring him in. Not seen any details financially, um, but this is why you brought Alshon Jeffrey in. So yeah, I would say he's going to get he's going to get fed. I think I think what we need to we need to say right now is by week three, um, I expect Neil to be saying. This is an excellent deal, but if we throw another fade route to Alshon Jeffrey in the corner, I will hunt Doug Peterson down and beat him over the head with a stick. It's a one-year deal for fourteen million. Alshon is betting on himself. I, I mean, you know, he gets fourteen. If this is this. This is one of these strange, strange things when we talk about this. Is the same when you talk about Kirk Cousins. Uh, we'll get on to briefly in a moment. Um, you know, oh, he's betting on himself. He's someone's just giving him fourteen million dollars. That is life changing money, and um, it's. I think he needs to be fit. I think he wanted, you know, I don't know, Matt Khalil money, wants, shall we say? And he wasn't getting that's it. ludicrous. 
That no, is no. a ludicrous deal. I know, but what I'm saying is he, he wanted... He wanted 30, 40 million and guaranteed and like 60 million and no one was willing to give him the money. No. Um, uh, on, on, if, we, if we just go on to that Khalil deal because we're, you know, we're, we're laughing about it. You know, the opposite of what the Browns have done on the offensive line I assume is what the Panthers have done. I, I honestly... Do you remember... We, um, oh Christ, Seahawks were signing Luke Joe. Um... I once joked that basically Gary Neville turned up for an England England squad and it was uh, Gary, we've had a few callbacks. Can your Phil play? So he, he, he said, oh yeah, I'll bring him along. This smacks similarly to what basically the Panthers done. They got Ryan Khalil. They said, hey Ryan, you know, any chance you can get your Matt to play? Yeah, yeah, I'll get him, yeah. Uh, yeah, let's say you're going, but you want, you want 25 million guaranteed. Yeah, that's fine. Jesus, Mary and Joseph, you didn't pay Josh, Josh Norman. You're not going to pay K1 Short or what's the other bugger's name? Star Lutula LA. Star you're going to pay this. You're going to play this clown twenty five million dollars. That, that's the bit. I, that, that's the bit you have to like. You don't understand, right? Is that like okay? If you know, if you're the Browns and you play that money, you're like, oh, we've got loads of money. That's fine. But last year you decided we're not going to pay Josh Norman because we haven't really got the money. And this year you were burning that money by giving it to Macaulay. He was. At best, below league average. At worst, stinking. Awful. Awful. I mean, yeah, but, you know, we're talking then about that that's a team that, you know, doesn't know what they're doing on the offen- on the offensive line. The Seahawks continue to plough no resources at all into their offensive line by basically signing a bust. Yeah, well, at least they've signed someone, do you know? It's better than the... Um, it's better than the... Uh... It's better than the usual of not signing anyone. Um, it looks like it looks like Tony, well, Tony Rome was definitely leaving Dutton. Um, if if you're him, do you stay in Texas or do you go to Denver? Um, you go to Texas. You go to the Texans. Um, you're staying in house, almost as it were, you know, in state. And it's, I think it's an easy division because you actually look at the Denver roster. Uh, my uh, friend of the show, Mike Clay, did bring this up. You could make the argument that the Denver roster in the in the AFC West is not the most talented compared to the other three teams. Could could you make the year. argument it's the worst? I think you could. Um, if, I mean, if you add if you add Romo to it, does it improve? Yes, but there's also no offensive line, so we'll get killed. He wouldn't have to be, you know, it's, he's, they're not going to expect him to drop back 700 times with Houston if they get a bit clever at how they use Lamar Miller. You know, they've got a few more weapons, get the ball out of his hands quickly, get it into, the, you know, into a DeAndre Hopkins. I would go to the Texans. Yeah, I think I, think I, I think I would go to the Texans. You look and you think, okay, the, the Broncos won only a f- couple of years ago. Not even, well, you know, 14 months ago, really. And, oh, you know, let's go. But they have lost a lot of players and... As you said, that the offensive line last year was putrid, and the the, the scary thing for anyone who signs Romo is, it, and as I meant to say, you want hit away from him not playing ever again. So you need to keep him upright. When he's upright, he's going to be tremendously talented. Do you know what I mean? He's a talented quarterback. I don't think there's any denying that. But he's thirty six, I believe. So he's not. He's he's. You need to stay away from that hit. But if he gets to Houston, he's got the defense to to do things. He's got. All, all the Texans have to do, and all they had to do last year, was score 24 points. The issue was, they couldn't score 24 points. Mm. I mean, three times, Brock Oswell threw 40 times and didn't get to 200 yards. That's obscene. That is, <laughs> quite frankly, disgusting. Um, what else have we got? The Jags have signed AJ Bowie. Well, the, the Jags have signed uh, the Jags have signed defence. Now, although the, the, they were supposed to have signed Clares Campbell, uh, I hear that might be a bit on the wane because he might be going to Denver now. No, he's he signed for a uh, he signed for the Jags. Oh, so they've signed Campbell and they've signed Bouye. Uh huh. So, so the pro- the problem is again they haven't got a quarterback. So they have they have a, a, what what looks on paper as an amazing defense now, really talented. But they've still got no one to throw it to Alan Robinson. Well, you know, we'll 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 get to that when we talk to Matt. Um, what else have we got? Chris Baker's gone to the Bucks. Here's another player quickly walking out the door in Washington. 
Um, yeah. Yeah, with Deshaun Jackson, of course. He is with Deshaun Jackson. Um, they will enjoy Tampa Bay. Deshaun uh, Jackson will, just, it will enjoy Tampa Bay too much. Well, there's no state income tax. And everywhere, you're either in Bush Gardens or a strip joint. Mm-hmm. Eagles have signed Chance Warmack to a one-year deal. Um, so if, we, if we're going on defence or whatever, what do we think of Stephen Gilmore going to the Pats? Well, that one came out of the blue. You know, we the last time the, the, the I can think the Patriots paying top dollar for a you know top market performer was a Thomas, Thomas, and that worked yeah. out wonderfully well because um, <laughs> he was a douchebag. Um, it's it just seems incredibly unpatriot like thing to do, and then the rumours start coming out that they're going to send Malcolm Butler to the Saints to get um, Brandon Cooks. Well. If if you can turn an undrafted free agent cornerback into Brandon, you are a wizard. I'm terribly sorry, everyone. Stop pretending he's human. He is not. He is from the order of wizards. He is Belichick the Blue. The thing is, as well, Dalton, as we as we've discussed on numerous occasions, if Bill Belichick rang you up and said, "Here's a million dollars. I want fifty thousand," you'd be like, "No, there's something wrong with this million dollars. It's either going to blow up. It's got." drugs on it, it's got the norovirus all over it. There's something wrong. So if, if I'm if I'm on if I'm on a trade with, with Bill, um I'm I'm thinking, how am I gonna get this wrong? The issue is for the New Orleans Saints is Sean Payton's an egomaniac. So he will think that he's winning any deal he does ever. Mm. And at the moment the the GM of the New Orleans Saints is too busy wondering how he can play Anthony Davis and Boogie Cousins on the same team at the, for the New Orleans Pelicans. Again, an issue for the Saints. Um, and also as well, you know, as we know, um, Drew Brees has no insight at all into that offence because that's the reason why Jimmy Graham and Kenny Stills aren't there anymore. I was shocked. Oh, you bollocks, son. Um, so obviously he doesn't like Brandon Cooks. Presumably he doesn't like wide receivers who come out and outside the huddle and say, I want the ball. Why are yeah. you throwing at him? Um, he's better than you. That's why, Brandon. Because he keeps on catching it, Brandon. It's an issue. Um, he's he's Michael Thomas, and he's a pretty good wide receiver. But he's also a, a keyboard warrior. Well, they both are. Um, both both of them love a tweet. So don't, don't we all? Don't be fu- yeah, well. We do. Don't. Um, well, that's that's it. We're fifteen minutes in. A lot of lot of deals going on. Uh, we'll. We, we, won't, we won't bore anyone with any more. We think we've hit the big ones. I'm sure some more will come up to make this podcast almost irrelevant as soon as we've done it. Uh, any, any there last... is one. Oh, oh, go on, I just want to stop you. Go on. Terrell Pryor is visiting the Redskins. Yeah, I like Terrell Pryor. Is he going to play quarterback? Um, may I have don't to. know, but, but here's an idea. When he does visit the Redskins, lock Snyder and Bruce Allen somewhere else. But that, that's cool, because if we lock Bill, if we lock Bill Snyder... If we lock Dan Snyder and um, and Bruce Allen, who is he speaking to? Kirk Cousins, the GM, presumably. Who, who, whoever that is, whoever that is. Done. Um, not enough time to go into the Washington uh, debacle at the moment, but I have thoughts. Um, we will talk about it probably next week. Hopefully, I'm sure we will. Done. Done. So let's let's get Matt Harmon on, and then. That'll be the end of the show. So, any last any last thoughts, Neil? Um, it's craziness. Twitter can't keep up with itself. Um, basically, any rankings that I've already done, which I did do, do my rankings for um, for Gridiron Experts last week, probably have to change some of them. But as an Eagles fan, yeah, I'm quite happy. At the end of the day, Dutton is being um, being being cool, calm, collected, while secretly, as I can see him on Skype. He's doing a party dance on his one-year $14 million Alshon Jeffrey deal. And on that note, talking about wide receivers, let's get on. The king of the wide the wide receiver, wide receivers, Mr. Matt Harmon, to talk reception, perception, and Brussels sprouts. And joining us now, Max and Lyrical, friend of the show, Matt Harmon. I think the best way to describe him is a writer and speaker of words about, about football for NFL.com and now host of the show that I can listen to and Dutton can't, and that's Fantasy Hipsters. Matt, how are we today? Oh, I'm good, and uh, 
Neil, I don't actually discourage you from listening. Please, everybody listen so that we can get those uh, get those download and stream numbers up. But no, thank you guys so much for having me. Uh, it's always good to talk to you fellas. Uh, it's a, you know, this is this is really a fun time of year for me uh, with free agency opening and uh, the draft still in full swing. This is kind of like you're getting it from both sides of the football world right now. So, I mean, I do. I, I have listened, but that's merely from my point of view to try and see how the other half live. You know, just just to a. <laughs> I can, again, trying to see both sides of the fence. We we uh, we welcome both hipsters and normies too, and uh, the mainstream <laughs> cats like you, Dutton. So we're 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 good. We we welcome everybody. Uh, you just might get belittled in the process, but who doesn't like that? Absolutely. Dutton's been getting that for thirty five years. Why change now? So, so Matt, if we, if we jump if we jump straight in, you, you said this is a busy time of year, uh, and obviously, you know, one of your I suppose one of the things you're, you're known for the most is reception perception, and things have changed about that this year. Can you tell us about those changes and what you're looking to introduce? Sure thing. So, yeah, this year I did agree to a deal with uh, the fantasy footballers, Mike Wright, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, those guys over there. They have a great podcast and um, doing a little work for their website now, too, uh, twice a week. Uh, leading up to the NFL draft, I'll profile a draft prospect receiver with reception perception. So far, I've gotten you know plenty of the big names done. I just actually put up John Ross yesterday uh, after his record-breaking forty time. I f- I felt that was probably a good uh, good good time to do it. Uh, so doing draft prospect analysis for them, and then this uh, this off season they'll release their ultimate draft kit, and in the draft kit will be an unprecedented. 50 NFL wide receivers will you'll get their full data my evaluation of them so yeah busy time with reception perception trying to bang through all this charting and uh, also write about draft prospects I mean you mentioned him so let's talk about him he basically blew up NFL NFL uh, and college internet on I think it was Friday and that was John Ross 422 outrageous I was I'd seen a little bit of him at Washington but I was straight on YouTube to watch one of them one of them videos they show where they, it only shows the good things and you're like, wow, this guy could be the greatest ever. <laughs> I guess the question I have is, from what you've charted, is he more than just the speed that we saw in the, on the combine? Well, speed obviously gives him you know, the, the trump card, the thing that he has that just really can't be stopped, and that blazing speed is, is very impressive. But, you know, yeah, that was the big theme of his reception perception profile is what else can he do other than just the, the speed? What else is there to John Ross? And I, I was very encouraged after doing his charting that he came out as above the class average and above the 50th percentile in all of success rate versus man, zone, and press coverage. So good work all around for Ross and uh, you see him also separate on dig routes, on out routes really well. He runs a good comeback. And, of course, again, on the nine route, he has incredible uh, separation scores as well there. So, to me, I think he does offer you know more ability than just a straight-line speedster. Uh, you know, we looked at a player like Will Fuller last year who – Really had that speed, but also had questions with his hands. To me, Ross is a much better prospect, and Will Fuller went in like the mid twenties, and I, I would expect uh, to that John Ross goes much higher than that if the team drafting him can get past his injury concerns. Um, given the recent troubles of USC wide receivers, uh, notably like Nelson Aguilar and Marquise Lee, um, have you seen anything of Juju Schuster Smith to make you think he can break from this worrying recent tradition? Well, he's something of a different guy from from the most recent USC receivers. I mean, you look at a player like you mentioned, Marquise Lee, Nelson Aguilar. Those are guys that are, you know, six feet or under. Um, They're kind of more known for route running, this, that, and the other. Juju is billed as like a big receiver. He was listed at 6'2 and 220, but he came in 6'1, 215, which I think makes more sense because – while he does make contested catches every now and again, his contested catch conversion rate in reception perception is under the class average. He's also not a consistent separator. So um, I don't think you're going to get an NFL star or a high-end starter out of Juju Smith-Schuster. I think he's more of like a low-end maybe starting receiver and best as like a number three option. I don't think he's somebody that you want to draft in the first or second round and then throw 120 targets at. But because he has... A, a pedigree a productive pedigree and he's from a, a even though it has a dubious history he's from a big school in the pac 12 um I, I i he might get overdrafted but he's not one of my favorite guys in this class 
So I suppose that that's the question is he isn't one of your favorites. Who is? A couple of guys I really like uh, outside, you know, the the obvious Corey Davis and Mike Williams and, and John Ross. I, I, I have a good opinion of all those guys, but off the mainstream guys that I like, uh, Carlos Henderson is a really impressive player to me. His uh, success rate versus press and zone coverage and reception perception is the highest over the last two years. Um, he's also great at making plays in the open field and running after the catch. Uh, a very impressive there prospect from Louisiana Tech. But Chris Godwin is a guy that I, I love, Chris Godwin. And I'm glad that I got that evaluation out there before he went out and had a big combine performance because you, know, you saw him running the 4-4s. Four uh, he, he jumped well and did everything that you kind of want in the at, at the NFL scouting combine this past weekend. And Godwin's a player that comes in at, with a 73% success rate versus man coverage and also the highest contested catch conversion rate I've had over the last two years among college prospects. So love Chris Godwin, really excited to see uh, what he does in the NFL. I've heard from a pretty good source that he will, even before this, the combine, that he, some teams had him graded as like a round one, round two player. So I, I think he might be one of the bigger surprises among the wide receivers this year. If we move away from college and into the pros, two of your boys, as it were, were Alan Robinson and Tyler Lockett. And they didn't have great years for, for different reasons last year, I guess. Are you confident that they can get back on get back on the horse, so to speak, and get some big numbers next year? Well, Robinson, I definitely think, will get back to maybe not producing at the level of 1,400 yards and 14 touchdowns, but... I think he would even admit that his own play maybe slipped a little bit last year, but a lot of it was just the overall dysfunctional nature of the offense around him. You know, obviously the quarterback is the biggest concern. Um, and I think we saw a big regression from Bortles, and that's the biggest question. Are we going to see him get back on track to get the ball to Allen Robinson? Um, that's a question yet to be answered, and I, I don't have a good conclusion there. But I would also expect their offense to change a little bit in that Last year, they were running so many routes that were just high degree of difficulty routes, you know, slow developing routes down the field. I would expect them to kind of rein Robinson in, much like we saw Doug Marone kind of have them do as soon as he took it, took over, like move him around the formation a bit, do some things to get him free. Um, I think we'll see some of that next year with Robinson. Uh, and, and as for Tyler Lockett, Health is now a factor uh, as he was injured all year, mostly with like a PCL injury. You saw him get back on track, saw him putting up big games. Then he broke his leg down the stretch. Um, is, he go- is he going to be able to rehab and come back right away, get into training camp, get into the preseason action after rehabbing that broken leg? We'll see because um, any lost time could be bad. And the the Seahawks are already rumored to be connected to Kamar Aiken, who is another one of the players that I really like that didn't do much of anything last year. So hell of a track record for me. But, uh, you know, <laughs> Kamar Aiken is a guy they, they reportedly have some interest in. So I think if we see them go out and make a move for another wide receiver, that's probably not a great sign on Lockett's health. Uh, so that that's the big X factor for him. But if he's out there playing, I, I expect the whole Seahawks offense to be much better this year. Lockett's injury was one of those ones where, you know, the, com- the announcement, and the commentators talk, oh, this is horrible, this is awful. Let's look at it again. No, let's not. You know, I've seen it once. I'm, I'm more than good now. Thank you. Hey, I wonder I wonder who that market is for that because you always hear people say, like, oh, man, I don't need to see that again. Is there anybody, like, sitting at home like, yeah, I'd like to – let's play that one back. I'd like to see it again. I, th- I think I, – I, I don't know. I think in the in the UK we had a situation, don't see, say, in 2005 and they replayed oh. that. About and he, his leg basically just started hanging off. He, he just yeah. complete. He, he just he, it was a kick and it was gone and his his leg was just almost bending the wrong way. And since that point, they, they've stopped showing it. So we don't know if there's just they need to get one so bad that everyone's gonna just say never again. Yeah, they just we just really have to get grossed out, I guess. Exactly. And Matt, one of my uh, fellow writers at Rose of His has asked me to ask a very important question. And I, I, I'll be honest, it's it's one I should have thought of myself. Um, how can you eat Brussels sprouts? <laughs> I knew it was gonna. As soon as I as soon as I heard the tone in your voice, uh, and it was a very important question, I was like, "This is going to be a sprouts related question." Well, are you ask? Are you asking me? I, I how how do I eat them? Because they're good. 
they taste good if you prepare them correctly. It's all it's all about preparation, man. You got to yeah, it, to me, I'm gonna. We're actually gonna go through this uh, on the Fantasy Hipsters podcast tomorrow. So if you're listening, please tune into that because um, I asked for I asked for questions for that show, and about I think four or five of them were all Brussels sprouts related. <laughs> so uh, people are dying to know, and it's all about preparation. Uh, whether you want to roast them or not, I prefer to to stir fry or like to saute them in a pan with onions and garlic um, and olive oil. Uh, and then the key is, though, because you don't want them to be, like, too hard. At some point during the cooking process, after they've browned a good bit, you got to cover them up with a, with a cover on the pan um, and then let them soften a little bit. And that'll, that's how you get it. you got to get it the right amount of crispy and soft. Because yeah. one of the rules I live my life by is that vegetables shouldn't crunch. That, that's just – that's that's a philosophy I'm, I try to be wedded to. It's got me this far. You know, not See, particularly far little, at all. I, I prefer a little crunch in the vegetables, whether it's like I much prefer sautéed broccoli over like steamed broccoli. Um, I like to, my kale to be a little crispy. I, I, you know, I don't I don't expect everybody to agree with everything I say food wise, but um, that's all part of the fun. And, and, and just just so you know, Neil, uh, kale, kale is a type of food, not not a friend of ours who lives in McGull. Um, it was boring. It is boring. Yeah. Um, uh, after your. After your backyard banter episode with Jason Romano, Matt, it inspired one of yours and Dalton's fellow tin cans, Justin Tule, to share his story regarding his battles with depression on Jason's blog. And it's a must read. I guess the question me and Neil have is when you first started the podcast, did you ever envisage that it would have that kind of impact on people? Uh, no, absolutely not. Um, and I've read Justin's post and it was really good. I'm actually going to have him on an episode of backyard banter at some point in the next couple of weeks. Um, which I'm, so I'm really excited for him to, to join the show. Um, and yeah, that, that's awesome for me to see. I mean, that's, you know, so much of being in the, uh, in the media is essentially opening up yourself to basically be a whore for, for lack of a better words, you know, (laughs) and like put yourself out there and constantly put yourself out there and seem like you're doing things for attention. But you know, things like the backyard banter or or backyard banter podcast or sharing any of my own personal stories. It's, it's never for like, Oh, look at me. I just, I would, I want other people to be able to hear these stories um, and go out and get inspired, whether it's to, you know, beat your own personal demons or just a simple, like, start my own blog and start writing about football. That's all I can hope for. So I, no, I never imagined that it's always weird for when people do say like, you've inspired me. Um, like really why I, I'm an idiot, but uh, it's nice to see. It's nice to see that's that impact. Uh, just like Justin like that. And hopefully it does for many other people too. I mean, the, obviously a few, only a few episodes into the second season as it were, but I think some of the, the, the episodes that have been so far on this season, some of the messages coming out of them, have already been incredibly powerful. Like, uh, was it Scott Bischoff? When he said, yep. you know, basically, he was saying how much his life has changed for the better. There's so many positive things after his car accident. You know, that friends he wouldn't have, he wouldn't have met his wife, and it was just incredible that he could take such a traumatic event and see the positives from it. Whereas, you know, I, I look outside, and think it's raining, and that screwed the whole day up. To be honest. Mm. Yeah. No. It's. It's unbelievable. I, I, had, I had met Scott before uh, that episode, and he had said that he would like to come on at some point. And, um, but that was the first time I had heard that story. Uh, and so for me, it was um, extra enticing just to sit there and listen to it. And I, I was really just – I was very moved by the whole thing, and I hope uh, I hope other people really enjoyed listening to Scott because it was definitely like – like you said, I'd echo that completely, that it was a very powerful message and like, you know – yeah, we all have our problems, but sometimes that you hear somebody go through something like that, and you're like, "Man, I I actually don't have it too bad over here." <laughs> so very very happy for Scott that he's found uh, a lot of peace and was, and also again very humbled that he was, uh, you know, I don't know, brave enough or or strong enough to come on my podcast and and share that. It was very cool. Uh, the last question from us, Matt. Um, obviously, you were touching at the start the Fantasy Hipsters podcast, which has now started. Um, you've you've already made it clear that you're welcome to you know if, if you're a hipster you're obviously part of the audience if you're not then you're welcome as well you're not going to count us out are you hoping to try and help us be hip or 
Are you just happy you're along for the ride? Because I'll be honest, I use the word sick, but it usually describes my physical condition, <laughs> uh, not to describe anything. Well, that that is a great question. Um, that that's why we have you know we have the football discussion at the beginning. We recap the news, um, and then after that, that's when we get into the other discussions. The franchise gives a music pick of the week, so maybe yeah, you know Neil, you can you can take whatever. Uh, I mean, I believe it was minus the bear last time. I'm sure he'll have something great for tomorrow's episode. You know, write down what he's talking about music-wise. Get in there, listen to it, tell your friends out at the bar, and they might be like, "Oh wow, Neil's a pretty hip guy. Uh, he knows this band." Or I, t- I know you. You know, I know you guys don't need any help with the with the beer selection, but I try to do my. I'll try to do my best and bring bring some beer discussion to the table. Uh, and then you know, we'll talk about beards and fashion and whatever else comes your way. So yeah, if you want to, maybe it's good if you're if you're not one of the hipsters. Uh, that's listening, take some notes. Bring it like a notepad along, and or maybe on your iPhone or whatever, pop pop up a, a, a keynote document. And just take take a few notes on what we're talking about, and maybe then you can approach our level of uh, of coolness. With uh, approach it, I think I think that's got to be the way forward, Dalton. Uh, we we just need to get you a pen and a pad because I thought of you. You're not you're not hip enough to get to get a Evernote or a OneNote on your on your uh, on your iPhone iPhone 3 I'm, or whatever just, one you've you got know, now. I'm just waiting for when, you know, they start talking about Dire Straits and the Water Boys. Exactly, Dean. Exactly. Um, I'm, I'm sure Matt has no Matt has, Yeah, Matt has no idea what we're talking about. No. <laughs> uh, so, Matt, as, al- as always, thanks a lot for your time. Um, as, as you said, check out, the new, check out the new podcast. Check out Season 2 of Backyard Banter. And uh, we hope to speak to you soon, sir. Absolutely, thank you guys uh, so much for having me. Uh, it's been a it's been a blast talking to you guys like it always is, and uh, wish you well the rest of uh, the rest of the off season. And free, like I said, free agency is here, and it's going to about to hit us in the face real hard.